preface to travels and adventures of an orchid hunter an account of canoe and camp life in columbia while collecting orchids in the northern andes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org travels and adventures of an orchid hunter by albert milliken preface this book aims at representing to the reader and especially the lover of orchids the circumstances under which these plants are found in the north of south america as well as being a guide to the traveller in colombia and the west indies besides endeavouring to set forth the natural riches of the country and the manners of the various classes of people from the wild indian of the forest to the polished and educated senator of the court it is not a missionary's report nor a traveller's diary nor a student's compilation but a narrative of things seen and experienced by me while travelling with natives through the forest sharing with them the hospitality of the wayside hut or the forest shelter and the campfire as well as the more agreeable life of hotels and towns the information contained in this volume has been gathered over a period of four years during which i have made five journeys to the orchid districts of south america the time occupied being generally from the month of october to the month of july the greater part of the illustrations are from photographs taken by me more especially those of the plant pictures in the forest both plant collectors and dealers have doubted the possibility of this because they have not before been able successfully to photograph odontoglossum alexandrae on its native trees or the native means used to drag the plants from their cold damp andean home but as i still hold the original negatives i shall be pleased to show them to any unbeliever in a work of illustrations like this there is much which the amateur photographer must leave to be finished by the skilful artist this has been entrusted to the hands of gustav guggenheim end of preface recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina chapter one of travels and adventures of an orchid hunter by albert milliken this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one on board the phantom having fully made up my mind for a long sea voyage and taken my ticket for anywhere and everywhere beyond the seas i provided myself with a stock of knives cutlasses revolvers rifle an overflowing supply of tobacco and newspapers and started on the third saturday of the eighth month of her majesty queen victoria's jubilee year after the usual ceremony of tipping railway porters and cab drivers i went on board the steam tug sunshine taking passengers and mails from the princess landing stage liverpool for embarkation on the celestial company's steamship phantom then bound for the spanish main a few minutes sail brought us alongside the phantom where after a careful inspection of the eating saloon cabins water filters etc by my unhappy relatives who consisted of several maiden aunts fifth cousins and godchildren they eventually said good-bye and as if to drive home the old-fashioned words each gave me at parting a remorseless hug no sooner had the sunshine re-embarked her living freight of weeping relatives overgrown ship's agents and postmen than a shrill screech from the funnel of the sunshine echoed back by a dull crunching sound from the screw of the phantom announced to all on board that we were in a fair way for a separation for an indefinite period from wives and sweethearts as well as the soothing associations of an english fireside the phantom although only a small ship of two hundred tons burden soon showed her superiority of sailing over her other river companions by passing many large ships which seemed to me to be encumbered by a superfluous arrangement of poles and white cotton 
and it was not long before the white-crested rollers of the ocean showed us that the mud-banks of the Mercy were left far behind. On looking round for what society the ship afforded, I found Spratt, the captain, an excellent fellow, who, besides the valuable information acquired by a long experience in and out of almost every port on the surface of the globe, possessed a good vein of humor, not at all despisable under the circumstances. Besides, he was not given to boring his companions in conversation with a long history of how many of those remarkable beings called lords, earls, dukes, marquises, etc., he had safely piloted over the Atlantic. I also noticed two of the passengers, the one, a stout burly gentleman of from forty-five to fifty years of age, to all appearances a retired sea captain. It might have been of a slave trader. The other, a delicate lady of eighteen, a beauty with the figure of a Venus and the features of a nymph, and a pair of large, black, fathomless eyes that would grace an Andalusian, whose melancholy was softened by dimpled cheeks of the most delicate peach bloom, the whole framed with a rich profusion of waving raven hair, a glance at which was sufficient to give you the impression that you had the pleasure of seeing a beautiful woman. A casual observer would imagine that the relationship between the elderly gentleman and the fair young lady was that of father and daughter, or guardian and ward. Imagine my surprise when at lunchtime I heard bald-headed Mr. Sharples inquire, Can I help you to a little of this fish, Mrs. Sharples? As I looked across the table I thought I detected a slight shrug of the fair shoulders and the melancholy of the melancholy eyes intensify. There might be something of sorrow hid behind so extraordinary a union. However, all the explanation that ever I had was contained in the underside of the lid of a work-basket, where, accidentally, I saw stitched in letters of comfort, better be an old man's darling than a young man's slave. As we steamed slowly away from land, each one on board seemed to linger on deck to watch the gray line of cliffs grow more faint and indistinguishable, until finally nothing was left to us of old England but cherished recollections, and night, throwing her dusky mantle over all, those who could began to seek asylum in their cabins, glad to escape from the weariness of a long day's excitement, the beautiful calm of the sea reassuring even the most timid. And now, for the benefit of those who are not accustomed to ship's bedroom furniture, let me endeavor to describe that used on the phantom. The bedsteads, commonly dubbed with the unceremonious title of bunks, are really large shelves, two in each room, one placed above the other, the lower one about two feet from the floor, and the other about four feet, very much reminding one of the shelves used in larders for jam and etc., except that each shelf is provided with a high edge, being a board about a foot and a half wide. This, with the four feet distance from the floor, renders it absolutely indispensable for the occupant of the top shelf to perform, night and morning, or as often as required, a no very desirable feat of gymnastics in order to place himself behind the side of the shelf. Aside from this stiffness in the bedsteads, everything seemed to be made on an opposite principle, water bottles, candlesticks, towel rails, etc., being suspended with as many joints as would lead one to imagine that each had emanated from a school of engineering where the application of the ball and socket was a specialty. However, after the foregoing inventory of my bedroom furniture, and a marvelous triumph of agility that I really never gave myself credit for, I managed to scramble safely onto one of the shelves, the lower one, as may be supposed, where after some dim visions of shipwreck, pirates, and cannibal islands, I slept soundly until six o'clock next morning, and I was only awakened by an extraordinary motion, alternately elevating my head and heels above the level of my body. Hastily dressing and going on deck, I found that through the night a strong headwind had arisen, whipping the sea into large foam-crested rolling billows, and making our little phantom swing and dance in a way that would put a switchback railway in the shade. 
one side of the ship would suddenly dive down until the top of her deck touched the water, while the other side was high in the air at an elevation of thirty feet, and this in turn would descend with a splash and a roar. At the same time several tons of salt water would sweep across her upper decks, and as quickly, with the change of position, blow over the side, this continual vibration being kept up for a period of not less than four days and four nights, sufficient to convince nervous people, not accustomed to seafaring peculiarities, that the owners of the Phantom had secretly entered into a contract with the Society for the Development of the Theory of Perpetual Motion. This unwarrantable infringement of the commonest laws of equilibrium materially affected the comfortable enjoyment of a bill of fare, which, although really good for the situation, was not absolutely free from that inevitable repetition of certain dishes to commemorate days of the week. For instance, pea soup Wednesdays and Fridays, plum dough Sundays and Thursdays, a regularity strangely peculiar to jails, workhouses, and barracks, and a system by which sailors mark the days of the week without the assistance of Whitaker. The table was provided with two long laths, which extended the whole length of each side at a sufficient distance from each other to admit of a plate being firmly wedged between the two, leaving room at the corners for all indispensable table utensils. The dishes containing the food were arranged in a line along the middle of the table, each dish partitioned off from his neighbor by a capacious bolster of serviettes. But even this contrivance did not prevent the chicken from dexterously changing places with the sardines, or the butter becoming irretrievably mixed with the curry, in a way which, even considering the extraordinary motion of the ship, appeared perfectly ludicrous. An attempt to avoid an overbalance by clutching your chair with both hands, which chair, by the way, is screwed securely to the floor, would result in the upsetting of a cup of hot coffee into your lap, or the inundation of your plate by the contents of an adjoining water bottle. On retiring to my cabin in the evening, I was greeted from the surrounding partitions with most unearthly sounds of choking. On inquiry, I was informed that all the ladies on board had been attacked with that uncomfortable disorder of the nerves or stomach called seasickness, which effectually confined them to their cabins for the ensuing week. And now, how to sleep in a bedroom performing such extraordinary antics was a problem not easily solved. It occurred to me to imitate the fellow who, on account of the effects of an overdose of Pomery 76 or some more disreputable stuff, sat down on the floor to wait until the bedstead would stop for him to get into bed. However, after this experience, the rude wind finally betook himself to other climes to play his unwelcome pranks and the sea settled down from a turbulent boiling mass of white foam to that calm placid blue that would fain make believe it was always like that. All this time we had seen nothing but an occasional passing ship of the kind I had remarked coming out of the mercy, so superfluously encumbered with sticks and cords. Now their utility became apparent. Each bundle of cloth had been unwound and dexterously hung in position best calculated to court the society of a fickle breeze. Each available corner was crowded, and the spotless whiteness of the canvas, intensified by the bright sunlight and the soft blue of the ocean, when contrasted with our own combination of smoky funnels and clanking engines, would give one to imagine that the strange fantastic craft was a visitor from the supernatural, or that Mercury, to better perform some peculiar nautical errand, had taken upon him the form of a gigantic sea-bird. However, putting all allegory aside, there is no more beautiful sight at sea than a full-rigged ship in sail on a fine day. After about six days sailing, I noticed one morning a long dark gray line on the horizon, which I imagined, in my want of marine experience, to be some passing whale or better still, could it not be the long chronicled and much exaggerated sea serpent out for his morning gamble? This pleasing delusion was quickly dispelled when Captain Spratt politely informed me that my wonderful sea serpent was nothing less than the island called Tercera, 
one of the Azores, situated in latitude 38 degrees 37 minutes north and longitude 27 degrees 13 minutes west, furnishing a beautiful semi-tropical retreat for visitors and a most useful coaling station in any emergency for vessels crossing the Atlantic. The Phantom kept on her course, making for the West Indian island of Barbados. The passengers passed the time lounging on deck, smoking, and watching the large flights of flying fish which rose out of the water at intervals and skimmed along a distance of thirty yards, making their large wing-like fins glisten in the sunshine like burnished silver, and then dipped themselves again into the water to be refreshed after so extraordinary an exertion. Those who have been long out at sea in fine weather cannot fail to remark the gorgeous spectacle presented by a sunset in a tropical latitude. As the mighty orb sinks slowly behind the distant band of blue, large masses of milky clouds gather around to honor the departure of the king of day, and, in return for their courtly attentions, are invested with a part of the fading splendor. Mountains of soft gray, while you are watching them, deepen into rich purple and gold. Cascades of silver and fountains of flame dance and sparkle in valleys of deep azure. Fantastic palaces with crystal towers would persuade the spectator that if fairyland exists, it must be somewhere in this vicinity. Early on Saturday morning, September 13th, after tumbling about on the Atlantic for fourteen days, we came in sight of the island of Barbados. At first sight from the sea, the wonder hunter is somewhat disappointed in the low, shelving appearance of the land. But this impression is quickly counteracted on a nearer approach by the varied and delicate hues of the large patches of sugar canes, clumps of coconut palms, and groups of bananas, with occasional dainty little villas peeping out from amongst the groves of mangoes breadfruit trees, and the gorgeous scarlet-flowered shrub called the frangipani, whose myriad clusters of blossoms contrast beautifully with the darker foliage distinguishable at a greater distance. Coming still nearer to the harbor of Bridgetown, we pass the lighthouse and flag station, the magnificent hotel at Hastings, which makes a charming resort for many European holiday-makers at this point of the bay, is seen to great advantage. As we passed the fine barracks, the shrill bugle call reminded us of the company of British officers and men who were passing a lively time amongst the agreeable Barbadians, and who, from what stray political opinions I could overhear, appeared quite able to set us an example in loyalty. The Phantom took up her position amongst the many other ships which were engaged in discharging cargo or awaiting orders from England. The houses of Bridgetown fringing the harbor are constructed of a light pinky stone, which, seen in the strong light of this climate, presents a most attractive appearance. Almost before the anchors had swung out of the bows of the Phantom, the ship was surrounded by a crowd of curly-pated negroes with long rows of white teeth and rolling eyes, contrasting amusingly with their ebony features. Some would make dexterous plunges and come up again on the other side of the ship, performing the clever feat for sixpence, while a group of youngsters were fighting and sputtering for occasional pence thrown to them by the passengers. Others would display a collection of wares for sale, all expressing their opinion or courting attention in a kind of jargon which reduced the Queen's English to a most miserable snarl. After the usual visit of inspection from doctors and custom-house officers, we were at liberty to go on shore by the medium of one of the many boats either hovering in the vicinity of the ship or crowding around the gangway, each of their black owners, meanwhile, squabbling for patronage. I need hardly say that all on board the Phantom who could avail themselves of the positive luxury of a little exercise on terra firma after a fortnight's cramping in bunks and deck chairs. A few well-directed strokes brought us to shore, and no more extraordinary sight presented itself to the newly arrived European than the motley medley of human faces, from the fair rose of the delicate European lady to the polished black of the negro, with the various between shades all busy about their morning marketing. 
the lover of tropical curios will find here quite a museum to choose from pink and white coral of the most delicate shades gossamer masterpieces of the coral insect's ingenuity patterns worthy of imitation by our most skilful lace and filigree workers midget hummingbirds in scarlet and green which nature indulgent goddess has provided with a special court dress to enable them more effectually to steal the virtue of innocent flowers delicate leaves and blossoms cunningly manufactured from glittering fish scales work in seeds moss and tortoise shell in short everything beautiful and curious well calculated to draw the money out of foreigners pockets passing through streets of well-kept shops most uncomfortably crowded with groups of gossiping negroes we finally arrived at the principal hotel called the ice house where each thirsty soul indulged in ice cream or native lemonade which was most refreshing considering the thermometer at this time registered the modest figure of ninety degrees fahrenheit in the shade after an hour's stroll amongst the pretty villas gardens and plantations of the suburbs the hoisting of the blue peter and the sound of a gun informed us that the phantom was ready to continue the journey so we lost no time in getting on board and as we steamed slowly out of the harbor another glimpse at the beautiful surroundings extorted from us a sigh of regret at so short a stay and a hope to return at no distant period End of chapter one recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina chapter two of travels and adventures of an orchid hunter by albert milliken this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two bound for trinidad the phantom quickly got under way making for the island of trinidad and early next morning as we turned up on deck we were greeted by the peaks and undulations of the principal island but as we are bound for the harbor and town of port of spain we must pass through one or other of the four or five channels made by small islands lying between trinidad and the mainland of venezuela making every excuse for my deficiency in accurate geological information it appears to me that the position of the islands would suggest to the most unobservant the idea that at some antediluvian or more remote period these colossal pyramids had formed part of the great continent of south america and that to satisfy one of nature's capricious whims they had been disconnected and arranged in their present picturesque situation be that as it may as the little phantom steamed gaily through one of the small openings between the islands the most unenthusiastic could not fail to be moved to admiration at the magnificent sight presented by the tremendous precipices rising to a thousand feet almost perpendicularly at not more than half a mile from the ship on each side were rugged peaks ornamented at the top with straggling vegetation and tenanted by myriads of screaming sea-birds while the lower part was riddled by enormous subterranean caverns once perhaps affording warehousing and apartments for enterprising pirates now only a playground for the sportive waves which one after another resolved themselves into clouds of spray with a wild murmuring sound fit music for so romantic a situation passing further through the strait we caught a glimpse of the blackened hulk of what was once a fine sailing ship carried on to the merciless rocks by the current which sweeps through between the various islands with great force the vessel at the time of the disaster was laden with coolies who were all happily rescued by a passing steamer along the coast between the bocas and port of spain the shore is interspersed and ornamented by many small bathing stations owned by the more wealthy townspeople pretty secluded retreats almost hidden by clumps of tangling vegetation and as if to break the wildness of the rugged uninhabited hills the passer-by is treated to a varying panorama of beautiful scenery furnished by a continuation of tiny islands seven or eight in number 
one larger than the rest furnishing accommodation for a commodious convict prison by the aid of a field glass it is easy to distinguish long lines of unfortunates pacifying justice by arduous labor another of the larger islands is used as a coolie station where the newly imported east indiamen find an asylum until their services are in demand for the sugar plantations half a dozen of the other islands are each about an acre in extent all boasting spacious mansions and gardens and an enviable appearance of seclusion from prying eyes passing these smaller islands soon brought us in sight of the harbor gay with ships from many nations several of the brightly painted paddle steamers which ply on the river orinoco at this time in the port were almost enough to tempt a rambler to compromise himself for a trip the usual formalities over we were not long in getting on shore to make ourselves as much acquainted with trinidad as the time would allow we found the streets and squares of the town very much wider and more commodious than those of barbados after strolling through the principal business thoroughfares we were content to avail ourselves of a conveyance to make the circuit of the savannah about which we had heard so much and i can assure any visitor not acquainted with these islands that to miss the opportunity would be a mistake we found the savannah nothing more than a large recreation ground of no extraordinary beauty encircled by a carriage drive of some miles in length but excepting a large space occupied by the governor's house and gardens almost the whole length of the route is enlivened by most exquisite little villas built after good designs painted in cheerful colors and draped with a profusion of tropical plants varying from the most delicate to the most extravagant tints one is almost hidden by myriads of pale pink flowers of the bougainvillea glabra on another the white stars of the jasmine contrast with the rich blue of the ipomea another of these fairy little retreats is ornamented with splashing fountains and groups of palms the rich green of which contrasts well with the bright patches of color in the way of yellow crotons and scarlet poinsettias with other wonderful and beautiful collections of tropical plants whose long scientific names it would tire to enumerate whatever the spacious government house may lack in beauty of architecture is amply made up for in profuse horticultural decorations besides smaller shrubs and climbers there are magnificent clumps of the tall feathery bamboos curious banyans and the remarkable strelitzia reginae with a perfect head of thirty feet in breadth the day of our visit being a holiday the young athletes of trinidad were engaged in a cricketing contest with a neighboring island and the savannah was gay with bunting as well as pretty faces we were very favorably impressed with the social character of the people of trinidad who seemed to me to possess at once the stability of john bull combined with the elegance of the spaniard and the politeness of the french visitors favored with more time than we were will i have no doubt agreeably prove what i say to be true for my own part when the usual sailing signal warned me that the phantom was going in search of fresh sights whether i accompanied or not i was reluctant enough to leave so inviting and genial a place a few strong poles brought us on board and we were very quickly under way for the harbor of la guerra on the mainland of south america the morning after leaving trinidad we passed alongside the island of margarita a long straggling barren-looking tract of land which appeared to have little or no cultivation and few or no inhabitants and at once associated itself with robinson crusoe-like adventures for any one having ill luck enough to be cast on such an inhospitable-looking place we were informed that at one time this was a pearl fishing station and at present there are some copper mines worked by european enterprise some two or three dozen natives out in small canoes engaged in fishing hove near the ship as we were passing in order to satisfy their curiosity on our no doubt novel appearance their boats were of the most primitive construction seeming almost too frail to put to sea in 
the men were of pure indian race a kind of dull brick color fine stalwart fellows who seemed to despise fashion so much as almost to do without clothing altogether after forty-eight hours sail we arrived in sight of the harbor of la guerra the principal port of venezuela which presents from the sea a magnificent panorama of scenery a towering peak a mile and a quarter high seems to pierce the clouds the almost perpendicular sides of the mountain bristle with large cacti while around the foot the little town of la guerra from the brightness of the walls and tiling seen in the strong light of a tropical sun presents a pleasing contrast with the dark gray and green of the mountain background high up the hillside a small fort breaks the wildness of the situation and whatever may be its merits or defects from a defensive point of view it certainly adds to the picturesqueness of the scene a little lower down a large circus-like building is easily distinguishable which we afterwards learn is the bullfighting arena without which no south american town of any pretensions would be considered complete no sooner had the phantom dropped anchor at a safe distance from the stormy coast than we were besieged as usual by an army of custom-house officers who are especially officious at this place and in their scrupulous anxiety to prevent the importation of anything approaching the character of contraband ammunition or infernal machines would scarcely pass a superfluous toothbrush or half-worn collar-box disputing everything in a nasal half-intelligible spanish which sounds to an englishman's ears unpleasantly like the action of a file on saw-teeth landing at la guerra for passengers is very difficult and even dangerous on account of a heavy swell rolling in from the sea and dashing in broken spray over the frail landing stage and more than likely giving the travellers a sound baptism of salt water once on shore the first thing that presents itself to the sightseer after wading through the crowds of squabbling negroes is a large coarse equestrian statue of the illustrious guzman blanco since thrown down the only pretension to art which la guerra can boast unless it is the immense patches of rouge and powder which bedaub the cheeks of every third of the young women one meets for certainly the houses and streets were made when architecture was in apprenticeship the interior of the town is miserably disappointing compared with the magnificent sight which the harbor presents from the sea the streets are inconveniently steep and narrow rendering them almost impassable for any vehicle being more like large drains made to carry off the enormous flow of water which rushes down the mountain side in the rainy season the appearance of the people of la guerra is scarcely more prepossessing to the foreigner than the place itself those who are not of the dark woolly-headed negro breed belong to the slim tall elegant spanish dandy type but differing from their spanish relations in possessing a much deeper shade of color and a peculiarly sinister expression of features which when excited by anger becomes almost fiendish giving the visitor an impression that these are scarcely the people to trust himself with in a lonely road on a dark night a burning sun every day striking on a dry sandy soil runs the thermometer up to over one hundred degrees in the shade and renders the heat almost unbearable this considered with the want of all convenience in the house and the uninviting appearance of the people putting all sarcasm aside the most charitable would scarcely be justified in advising la guerra as a health resort for invalids End of chapter two recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina chapter three of travels and adventures of an orchid hunter by albert milliken this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the la guerra and caracas railway we were delighted to learn that the latest novelty here is a railway from la guerra to caracas the principal town of venezuela we gladly took tickets to the far end pleased to escape from the heat and at the same time to see the country 
if a tunnel could be drilled through the mighty mountain the distance from the port to caracas would be five miles but the railway is twenty-seven miles in length winding about amongst the mountain passes in the most fantastic zigzag crochets gaining in the twenty-seven miles an altitude of over a mile the train is made up of the engine one first and two second-class carriages mere frames to catch as much as possible of the sultry breeze the front of the engine is provided with two bags of sand and a boy on each side to put the sand on the rails providing the wheels should revolve without making progress in the steep ascent after the usual ceremony which accompanies all kinds of business in this country the last portly old dame with an enormous basket of fruit and some chickens was effectually stowed away in a corner and we started on the journey at first along the shingly beach passing a horde of miserable tumble-down huts then through a fine plantation of coconut palms for several miles of level road here began the ascent of the mountain and at the point where we lost sight of the fine sea view together with the harbor and town of la guerra we had already gained a quarter of a mile in height still we continued here winding around enormous boulders further along crossing deep ravines of five hundred feet in depth on flimsy bridges over which it seemed scarcely advisable to trust human life at one point creeping along the mountain side with a height of half a mile above and as much of almost perpendicular precipices below among scenery that would vie with the alps in grandeur but where the breaking of an axle-tree would probably submit us to a fate compared with which the tay bridge accident would be merciful the passenger cannot fail to notice the extraordinary structure of the tunnels at some points where a more than ordinary splinter of rock comes in the way a pigeon-hole had been drilled through the hard stone and left without any superfluous padding of brickwork and so the scenery and the structure of the railway continued all the way to caracas so admirable in fact that no visitor who comes to la guerra should miss the sight on arriving at caracas we were prepared to feast our eyes on the usual incongruous collection of tumble-down mud huts so peculiar to these parts of south america and the reader can imagine our agreeable surprise when we steamed proudly into a smart little station of quite european pretensions with clean cemented platforms ornamented with flowers and creeping plants and thronged by an aristocratic class of people who appeared by their dress at least to be fresh arrivals from paris on leaving the station a pretty church of elegant design built on a slight elevation attracts the attention of the sightseer by its spotless white towers five minutes ride in a tram-car brings us to the large commodious houses and wide streets of the principal part of the town the largest square or plaza although somewhat small and cramped in comparison with the size of the buildings surrounding it is gay with flowers and two large splashing fountains in the gardens of the municipal buildings do their best to give the place an air of coolness in spite of a sun sometimes more than oppressive the presidential residence and government offices are buildings of excellent design and substantial construction one side of the plaza is taken up by a large college for high-class scientific education an institution which is a real ornament to the situation it is a pity that venezuela does not possess more such five large magasins and stores several excellent hotels restaurants a la francaise and so much convenience for business and pleasure are to be found in the pleasant little venezuelan capital that if there should be a european who still entertains the idea that there is no society to be found in south america but wild indians he will do well to pass a week at caracas to improve his education for my own part the thought that the phantom was perhaps already under way made it impossible for me to get more than a glimpse of the town hastily swallow a cup of the celebrated caracas coffee and take a return ticket for la guerra i would have willingly stayed to collect the lovely cattleya mossiae 
which is found in plenty growing on the branches of trees in nearly all the mountains around caracas and is now to be had with the greatest ease for the indians bring large quantities of plants into the city for sale at a very nominal price instead of the poor plant collector having to brave all the dangers of the forest as in other districts only to obtain a few dozen plants one thing struck me as being more extraordinary than all the peculiarities of the people country or constitution that is that on a railway where every mile presents a thousand dangers no enterprising life assurance company had so far speculated on human vitality as to issue assurance tickets in the descent of this single line of goat's track the magnificent scenery appears even more beautiful than on the upward journey and the track itself if possible more dangerous for the passengers cannot help wondering where we would stop providing the brakes fail to act on a railway which descends a mile in twenty-seven miles of distance on arriving at la guerra we quickly engaged boats for the ship and got on board just as the phantom was firing a parting salute no doubt to do honor to the officious custom-house officers we were quickly on our way for the harbor of puerto cabello meanwhile congratulating ourselves that we had received the value of our seventeen shillings with compound interest a few hours sail always in sight of the rugged coast of venezuela brought us to the harbor of puerto cabello a large old-fashioned lighthouse in the form of a chinese pagoda and a still older castellated fort whose hundred pigeon-holes bristle with pygmy cannon which seem more fit subjects for a curio museum or to be used in some mimic theatrical representation than to be of any service in modern warfare these are the first and almost only objects of interest the situation affords for the traveller the harbour being commodious enough to admit of ships coming to land we dispense with the services of the black boatmen and walk on shore mr Kahn, the excellent british consul is always ready to welcome visitors but the very ordinary and somewhat neglected appearance of the town does not offer much temptation to voluntarily stay long in puerto cabello the harbor affords excellent convenience for the exportation of coffee minerals and other products of a large tract of country and a large amount of business is done every one here seems to be as much on the alert to turn a penny as the people of caracas are to display a new suit or a bonnet two small public parks both crowded with gorgeous flowering plants give one an idea of the almost spontaneous vegetation of these parts in one of the gardens are twelve magnificent palms each towering to a height of nearly one hundred feet specimens of exquisite beauty enough to make the least covetous wish that they could be transported just as they are to hyde park or kew gardens the only pity is that the last time the people of venezuela indulged in a revolution a quantity of the bullets intended for other purposes pierced the stems of the palms and disfigured them with many ugly marks for those who care to see the country a well-made line of railway runs from the port to the town of valencia or better still take a horse and ride to the nearest village on the hills a journey of about three hours where the beautiful scenery and rich vegetation of the wild uncultivated forest amply repay the exertion as the phantom was lying in port for the night within a short distance of the fort those who passed the time on board were treated to a peculiar concert at first novel enough but eventually disagreeably monotonous in the fort now used as a prison there are something like three hundred unfortunates who for the time being are deprived of the privilege to roam the wild hills of venezuela they are guarded by a dozen sentinels at equal distance from each other around the fort it seems to be the duty of each one of these to cry out at the top of his voice the two spanish words sentinela alerta every half hour of the night from sunset to daylight leaving an interval of two or three minutes between each one beginning with the first man and continuing until the circuit of the fort is made perhaps the most amusing part of the system is the difference in the tone of the various voices 
the first one will roar out the password in deep sonorous tones no sooner has this died away on the still night air than the next one begins with a shrill piping treble this in turn giving place to another who in a soft singing voice prolongs the two words to twice their ordinary length while a fourth seemingly impatient at being disturbed jerks out the words in a sharp military rattle and so on until the twelfth one proclaims them all alerta in a tone at least an octave higher than his predecessors as the vessels are moored almost directly under the walls of the prison this half-hourly repetition of so extraordinary a comedy renders sleep utterly impossible and we were not sorry when next morning the phantom steamed out to sea and so gave us a chance of a nap in the cradle of the deep our next calling place was the island of curacao and in the short sail from puerto cabello nothing occurred worth the attention of the reader to the traveller whose business is to investigate the beauties of foreign lands the first impressions of the island are anything but satisfactory as far as the telescope can reach nothing is to be seen but an expanse of sandy desert or barren rocks and these if not entirely devoid of vegetation only produce a weedy scrub however this monotony is soon relieved by our coming in sight of the whitewashed walls of the old-fashioned dutch town two well-garrisoned forts form a sufficient protection to the town and harbour in passing the dutch ensign which floats from the top of the fort the captain of the phantom in pursuance of certain laws of maritime etiquette politely dipped the union jack three times in the water a compliment which was as politely returned by the dutchman answering the salutation in the same form the harbour although presenting a most gay and busy appearance is somewhat small and cramped and it was with considerable exertion that our little phantom was brought near enough to the quay to do business the principal parts of the town are built on each side of the narrow harbour besides this a kind of canal branches off into the other parts of the town cutting the streets at right angles the harbour as well as the canal is crowded with small boats for the convenience of passengers who are obliged to be crossing and recrossing from one street to another these boats generally a kind of punt are a most primitive cockle-shell contrivance which however at one time may have been a dutch patent they are perfectly flat-bottomed and not more than a foot and a half deep reminding one very forcibly by their general appearance of a large drinking trough the mode of propelling them is scarcely less comical than the craft itself the oarsman takes up his position standing in the stem of the boat with a piece of wood in the form of an overgrown mustard spoon which he wriggles from side to side in the water in imitation of the action of a fish's tail for the price of a few tiny coins something less than half a farthing each crowds of people of all classes in search of business or pleasure are conveyed from street to street if not with the greatest swiftness certainly with the greatest security as up to the present an accident has never been known the language spoken here is perhaps the most curious of the novelties which attract the attention of the stranger on arriving at curacao the extraordinary arrangement of sounds called creole dutch strikes upon the ear as something between the growling of dogs and the cackling of poultry an arrangement of gutturals and nasals equally as difficult to describe as it is to understand it appears to me to possess neither rules nor system but should it have both to the initiated it is certainly devoid of beauty of euphony the people seem to be preoccupied with a quiet industry so peculiar to the character of the dutchman scores of women are employed in making a kind of straw hat of soft white grass very inferior however to those made in many parts of colombia another class of industry carried on here on a considerable scale is the manufacture of gold and silver ornaments in filigree work and considering the great want of convenience and machinery many of the specimens are very beautifully made although there is very little of importance to make any one regret leaving the dreamy little town we were abruptly called away by the shrill whistle from the phantom 
before we had time to get a fair look around. End of chapter 3 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 4 of Travels and Adventures of an Orchid Hunter by Albert Milliken. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sailing to Barranquilla. After some little difficulty, we were again out to sea and making for the port of Savanilla. On our way thither, we were aroused before sunrise with the news that we were passing in sight of the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta and there was a possibility of seeing the sun rise on its perpetual snow we had not long to wait a considerable time before the first rays of sunlight appeared across the water it was still the dull twilight of early morning with us those who were looking towards the mountains could distinguish the summit gradually becoming brighter as the first sun ray fell upon it until the mighty mass of ice and snow shone like a coronet of monster diamonds and this appeared more striking and beautiful because of the huge base of the mountain being still almost in darkness however as the phantom was going full speed we were not long in being out of sight of the sierra nevada each one sorry that so beautiful a scene should be so transient keeping along the rugged coast we were soon in sight of what is called the harbor of savanilla if this had been the entrance to the greatest penal settlement in the world it could not have been a more barren and desolate looking place as far as the eye could reach nothing was to be seen but bare rocks and sand and there was not a vestige of a town or even a hut in sight to show that the place was inhabited the phantom dropped anchor i supposed on speculation nothing being likely to welcome us but a host of screaming pelicans fishing from the rocks or the crowds of ugly vultures in their strange funereal garb continually wheeling over our heads in search of some corpse the shallowness and muddy appearance of the water showed that we were really anchored in the delta of the river magdalena here i intended to disembark in order to profit by the means of communication which this river affords with the interior of this part of columbia but on looking around i must say my ardor was somewhat damped to all appearance this could be no other than the abode of savages however considering the old adage that faint heart never won fair lady i went below and quickly packed up my traps upon reappearing on deck i was informed that a small tender was coming off to the ship from a station hid behind a bluff and in three long hours after the issue of the proclamation the little machine appeared alongside having occupied all that time in making a distance of about four miles it is absolutely beyond my power accurately to give a description of this rickety and antiquated piece of marine architecture called the funza I only wish it could be exhibited in London for the edification of our modern boat builders and engineers. In the year 1810, the hero, Bolivar, fought for the release of his countrymen from the Spanish yoke. I am persuaded that at that time this craft may have been one of his gunboats, but if so, he must even then have bought it second hand. It would scarcely be doing justice to the progress of the country, not to mention here, that in the four years which have elapsed since my first landing the funza has been laid aside and its place taken by a smart little boat of more attractive appearance and more substantial workmanship however after bidding good-bye to the most excellent and kindly captain and officers of the phantom i went on board the funza with a few more passengers all spanish-speaking people whom we had taken on board in the west indies each one stowed himself away as best he could on top of his baggage in what i call the stokehold of the engine preparing to wait the three mortal hours which would elapse between leaving the phantom and arriving at the station i will endeavor to describe the whole of the journey from here to the town of barranquilla so that whoever may be disposed to follow me in this part of the coast of south america may not run away with the delusion that he is going to disembark at Cannes or brighton 
On arriving at the station, we drew up to the side of what appeared to be the companionship of the Funza. Across this we passed with our baggage into a shed, consisting of a roof and four posts, where all the luggage is weighed. After this, the boxes are seized by a crowd of coppery-colored Indians and carried off, if you like to pay them, to where the train is standing. Here, all those useful adjuncts which a European finds so necessary and convenient in a station, such as booking office, refreshments rooms, station masters and porters' offices, are deemed superfluous, and the train is moored on the bare open ground. This station is called Salgar. More recently, a new port has been made called Puerto Colombia, and although still only a very temporary landing stage, it can boast of many more conveniences than Salgar. The whole town of Salgar is composed of six or seven of the worst mud huts I have ever seen. These huts cannot be described as being either round, square, or oval, but are made of sticks plastered with mud and thatched with palm leaves. A few copper-colored naked children, a few dirty half-naked women, and a score of horrid lean pigs, more resembling hyenas, make up the tout ensemble. One more item which I have overlooked, that is the house in which is sold the spiritous liquor of the country called Anasato. In this house are congregated porters, engine drivers, and passengers, all intent for the moment upon the one object of quenching the terrible thirst caused by a tropical sun striking on the dry sand. When the last man had swallowed his dram, we were told in sharp, squeaking Spanish to take our seats, and soon the ponderous machine was put in motion. The whole of the distance from here to Barranquilla occupies about an hour, and the entire railway is laid through thick jungle, novel enough to the foreigner, but compared with the magnificent forests to be found in the interior, only mere scrub. Finally, we arrived at Barranquilla, and now comes the question of passing our baggage through the customs. In every port in the world, I suppose this is a source of much trouble and annoyance to passengers, but above all at Barranquilla, and for anyone to arrive in possession of two guns is almost sure to result in the confiscation of one of them. I arrived here on a Saturday and found it impossible to pass my baggage through the customs until Monday. So, leaving my few traps under the lock and key of the officers, I went off into the town to what is called the Hotel Francais, by no means the grand hotel of the place, but a respectable lodging house kept by a kindly French matron. The food supplied in the hotels of Barranquilla is somewhat extraordinary to the taste of a foreigner, of which I shall have more to say later but the bedrooms I can scarcely pass over here without a remark. These are as large and commodious as it is possible to make them, taking up the entire space from the floor to the top of the house, not being encumbered with any furniture, so as to leave them as airy as possible, and render the heat somewhat tolerable. The bedsteads are about the only things which detract from the fearfully bare and comfortless appearance of the place, and these bedsteads might be mistaken by a careless observer for monster meat-safes, being such a curious combination of gauze and laths, the practical use of which only becomes apparent at night, as a protection against the myriads of hungry mosquitoes which swarm the place. Early next morning, being Sunday, I went for a stroll to get a look at the town. I found it large, apparently of about some thirty thousand inhabitants, admirably situated on the bank of a natural canal at the outlet of the Magdalena, and so calculated to receive the whole of the product of the enormous tract of country drained by this magnificent stream. But, apart from its excellent position for export and import trade of every kind, there is very little to recommend Barranquilla as a residence for Europeans. The heat is oppressive, and the streets are filled with a kind of white sand, which on the least breath of wind rises into the air in blinding clouds. The houses in the suburbs of the town are somewhat tumbled down and unsightly, mostly thatched, but the profusion of beautiful plants, which almost hide many of them, makes up for the want of architectural beauty. 
many of the principal streets as well as the plaza have been very much improved lately by the construction of more elegant houses and the popular south american bullfighting arena has been removed from the plaza to a more out-of-the-way position notwithstanding the very commonplace appearance of the houses outside many of them inside are fitted with the greatest richness and good taste possessing an easy luxury so peculiar to people of spanish descent and admirably adapted to the climate as a rule apart from bedrooms boudoirs and kitchen each house possesses a special saloon which serves for reception ball and drawing-room gay with gilded lamps and mirrors and rich with luxurious carpets and lounges besides rare paintings and bric-a-brac that would grace the drawing-room of a rothschild enterprising traders have stocked the town with immense shops and stores but instead of the visitor being entertained with the pleasing pastime of looking into shop windows he is met at every turn by dismal-looking iron gratings which serve in their place the immense variety of merchandise being only visible on entering the store barranquilla seems to be progressing socially and commercially as much as any other town in the republic amongst the oldest of the foreign pioneers every one visiting the coast is familiar with the name of mr joy and mr stacy englishmen who are respected and beloved alike by foreigner and colombian while mr cisnero a rich cuban seems untiring in forming schemes for improving the commerce and adding to the convenience of the town a tramway has lately been constructed through the principal streets this is not only very useful but is well patronized and while i write machinery for the electric light is in the course of construction the telephone is already fitted in the offices of all the principal merchants and the great advantages which barranquilla possesses of communication with europe will i have no doubt soon place it on a level with more advanced cities rumors are constantly heard of the unhealthy state of the town they are generally founded upon the idea that because the climate is hot it must be unhealthy in the various years i have known barranquilla i have never seen a case of infectious disease originate here most of these cases are brought from along the coast or from other parts of the valley of the magdalena the well-to-do families here are not only cultured and educated but very often display much personal attractions some of the ladies are represented in the adjoining photograph dressed for their annual festival called the carnival the common people are of a light copper color seemingly half negro and half indian but with very little to recommend them either in form or intelligence one of the greatest difficulties a foreigner finds on arriving here is the system of small banknotes and other kinds of money in circulation native gold coins have almost disappeared and since the last revolution few if any have been coined in colombia and most of the large business transactions with foreign countries being made by bills of exchange if an englishman or north american arrives with a few sovereigns or twenty dollar pieces his best plan taking into consideration the rate of premium above the price of native money is to go to the bank of barranquilla or to the office of mr august struntz the estimable agent of the royal mail and thereby the paper money of the country according to the rate of exchange this fluctuates very much with the demand for gold coin i have sold english sovereigns at the rate of one hundred twenty five per cent premium or for one hundred dollars of english gold i have received two hundred and twenty five dollar notes the notes in circulation above one dollar are five twenty fifty and one hundred dollars in value while the dollar note may be divided into ten parts each small note being called one real worth about two pence halfpenny in english money the next higher in value is called two reals worth at the rate of exchange current about five pence the dollar is further divided into a five real or half dollar note worth one shilling these with several nickel coins of small value make the whole system very intricate and very confusing i was detained in barranquilla several days much against my will 
but at last learning that a boat was preparing to make the journey up the magdalena and this being the best way of getting to the interior of colombia at the same time affording an excellent sight of the scenery on the river i hastily packed up my little luggage which by the way was not very cumbersome consisting only of a saddle and necessary horse harness a change of linen and a gun a hyde park rambler or tourist to the english lakes might think so scant a wardrobe scarcely sufficient to make him presentable for a six months journey but allow me to suggest to any one tempted by business or curiosity to make a similar journey to bear in mind that dress suits and tall hats are as much out of place in a south american forest as a pig in a drawing-room and a weight a bit thorn is no respecter of persons or material End of chapter four recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina chapter five of travels and adventures of an orchid hunter by albert milliken this librivox recording is in the public domain a river steamboat the boat was advertised to leave at half past seven a m and approaching that time the way to the wharf was all astir with clumsy vehicles ploughing their way almost up to their axles in sand bearing passengers and baggage i remarked that whatever luggage the passenger possessed besides every one seemed to be provided with a large roll of muslin a large bottle and a piece of peculiar coloured matting the muslin was for mosquito curtains the bottle contained at least half a gallon of rum to kill the microbes and counteract the bad effects arising from the water of the magdalena besides satisfying a secret propensity which many colombians possess for tragos a spanish word which might be easily interpreted as a drop of the crater the piece of matting was destined to supply the place of a bed while dusky porters were noisily stowing away bales and portmanteaus and sharp native gentry were disputing with them about the price i had time to look over the boat there are on the river altogether some thirty of these craft for the most part large and commodious built as i would call it in two stories being flat-bottomed and drawing only about two feet of water the floor of the lower story is level with the water about half the front part of the boat at this level is taken up by an enormous stack of wood used for fuel for the engines in the middle is the space for cargo while further on is the driving gear for the large stern paddle wheel above this on the next floor is the accommodation for passengers a few cabins on each side and a large saloon in the middle whilst the prow is reserved as a space for recreation on the roof of this again are built the cabins of the captain and officers the three sections carry the construction up to a great height considering the little depth below the water the whole being built as light and airy as possible and gaudily painted red and white has somewhat the appearance of a travelling menagerie to europeans although very pretty and admirably adapted to the situation about midday everybody on board seemed to have got all they required so we started down the narrow arm of the magdalena which leads from barranquilla into the main river here we passed the majority of the other river boats lying either waiting to be dispatched or to be repaired here too we came in sight of what appeared to me to be the public baths and wash-houses of the town for a distance of about a quarter of a mile along the side of the canal large trunks of trees are placed at intervals of a few yards from one another and at a depth of three or four feet in the water here at least a hundred or a hundred and fifty half-naked women and children laughing and talking splashing and screaming were engaged in washing the linen for the more wealthy people of the town this is done by alternately dipping the clothes in the water and then pounding them lustily on the trees in a way that would make an english housewife tremble for the safety of her coarsest towels not to speak of the possible welfare of muslins and cambrics leaving the washerwomen we followed the canal down towards the sea in order to reach the main river 
and once in the main waters of the magdalena the scenery was very beautiful looking seaward a wide expanse of white water rolls swiftly along to mix itself with the blue of the ocean while ahead of us the flat roofs and tall red pagoda-like towers of the town of barranquilla standing out in relief against a background of a thousand leagues of trackless forest furnish a sight at once fantastic and picturesque on looking around amongst my fellow passengers i found as cosmopolitan a company as could be imagined several germans a russian a frenchman and a family of peruvians the usual band of italian peddlers it is customary to meet with in every part of the world was here in full force but the majority in point of numbers were what may be styled well-to-do colombians these vary in appearance from the coarsest thick-set type of indian to the slim elegant gentlemen of spanish descent with pointed mustachios and high-heeled boots each one was busily occupied in arranging his or her effects to the best advantage considering the small space allotted for each person soon however the soft musical treble of the french and italian languages mingling with the deeper bass and tenor of the german and spanish gave one to understand that each was bent upon making the best of the situation irrespective of difference in creed or language name or station although we were placed on a platform immediately above the boiler and in close proximity to numerous antiquated misplaced steam pipes the absence of any uncomfortable motion of the boat compared with the disagreeable churning of a sea voyage and the tempering of the heat by a soft breeze smelling of a thousand flowers from the forest make the first impression the traveller receives of navigation on the magdalena anything but disagreeable whilst i was thus engaged in making something like an inventory of the people the situation and the surroundings the bell sounded for dinner perhaps it may not be out of place here for the sake of any who may care to make the same journey to mention how the inner man is cared for on these river boats the viands although somewhat extraordinary to the taste of a european are as good as the country affords and well suited to the situation in the first place to prove that the soup is no spurious imitation each plate is furnished with two or more turtles eggs which float on the top as a kind of trademark these on first tasting them are scarcely as good as they look but once the palate becomes accustomed they prove excellent eating the fish is probably a small kind of perch which abounds in the magdalena but is served so mashed up that it is impossible to say whether it is salmon or lobster flesh meat of every kind is here very inferior as the heat renders it impossible to keep it for two days without a large quantity of salt besides hanging it in the sun all this together with a very ordinary mode of cooking renders most of it anything but palatable the vegetables consist of sweet and ordinary potatoes together with a cassava root a variety of tropical fruits and coffee conclude the repast the sleeping arrangements on board these boats are of the most novel on the approach of evening the deck is cleared and about a dozen trestle bedsteads covered with a kind of sacking are brought out one of these is allotted to each passenger who immediately commences with his arrangements of cord and muslin so as to hang his mosquito net in a position to cover the whole of the primitive bedstead and keep the hungry hordes at a safe distance if in the journey up the magdalena the luxuriant vegetation should become monotonous by continuation this is relieved by occasional villages of true indian construction the huts are low beehive-like structures with walls of mud and thatched with palm leaves others probably on the improved system are made by driving stout bamboo stakes into the ground about four inches from each other to form the walls or more correctly speaking the enclosure this like the former is thickly thatched with palm leaves inside all ostentatious extravagance in matters of furniture is religiously avoided bedroom dining-room and drawing-room suites here are all supplied in a primitive manner by about half a dozen blocks of wood serving the purposes of lounge chairs and fauteuil 
while a hammock or a few cowhides take the place of bedsteads and eiderdown. A collection of gourds and calabashes with a few cracked bits of native pottery furnish an inexpensive and at the same time effective table service. However, whatever art has neglected in interior convenience and decoration, nature has supplied with lavish prodigality in the surroundings. For although each Indian may not exactly, according to the proverb, sit under his own vine and fig tree, he can yet even better build his hut and stretch himself at will under the shade of some magnificent banyan, luxuriant mango, or graceful coconut palm. Although there may be an amusing want of uniformity in the way of one extremity of the house being round and the other square, and an unexplainable want of perpendicular in the walls, the roads between the houses are straight and broad, and in many cases the whole plan of the village is well arranged. The fine growth of trees on each side form avenues as spacious and beautiful in their way as any boulevard in the gay French capital. On the other hand, some are absurdly humble jumble, and the red-skinned architect seems to have been determined, when choosing a site, to put his neighbor to the utmost inconvenience or satisfy his most eccentric caprices. Most of the people in the smaller villages are of a dusky red color with shiny black hair. They are well made and symmetrical, many having regular features, and none with very disagreeable countenances. Some are even pretty. They seem to me to be a simple, inoffensive people, caring little about industry and less for fashion. Most of the men are satisfied with a flimsy shirt and trousers, and some are content with less scanty garments, while children of all age dispense with clothing for the time being. As we stopped at most of these stations to take on wood, we were inevitably besieged by a crowd of natives offering us a few fruits, native pottery, monkeys, parrots, turtles, and tortoises for sale. All were laughing and joking, apparently in the highest spirits and the best humor, and to those who could understand their jargon Spanish, probably criticizing severely European novelties in the way of passengers on the boat. Their greatest fault appears to me to be their indolence, and, although possessing considerable civilization from constant intercourse with Europeans, I have no doubt their habits are much the same as they were when Christopher Columbus first shook hands with them. Some of the fishing villages present quite a lively scene, and possess quite a fleet of canoes which are very peculiar in appearance, each one being hollowed out of a single tree of some twenty to twenty-five feet in length, two and a half feet in depth, and from three to five feet in breadth. It is no unusual thing to see whole families floating dreamily down the river in one of these unpretentious craft, taking with them a load of fish, poultry, and fruit for sale at the mouth of the river, and as they probably occupy from a fortnight to three weeks, according to the state of the river, they must, of course, take on board both toilet and culinary requisites. Though each boat is provided with short spoon-like oars, they are only used in crossing the river. The ascent is made by means of long, stout sticks about twenty feet in length. The boatman places his stick firmly on the root of a tree or in the sand of a bank, and then walks sharply back to the stern of the boat half a dozen paces, and is followed in turn by his neighbor. Sometimes as many as six men are required, on account of the strong currents, and they continue this arduous labor for a week together, creeping slowly up the side of the river day after day under a burning sun. The traveler on the Magdalena River will not fail to notice many curiosities of the animal as well as vegetable world. Hordes of enormous alligators swarm its banks on either side, Half a dozen or more bask on every sandbank, varying in size from five to twenty feet long, and in color from light gray to a sooty black. I have counted as many as thirty on one sandbank, yawning sleepily in the sun, as tame as a herd of cattle, and affording excellent sport to the passengers. But a ball, sometimes two or three, must be well planted to stop one of these lazy gentlemen from shuffling away to die in the bottom of the river out of sight of prying eyes. 
large and small lizards dart in and out of the creepers which festoon the river banks but scarcely give one time enough for a shot sometimes several hundred of large black ducks with a kind of saw-bill stand like a line of soldiers absolutely fringing the sandbanks they are an easy prey to the sportsman but when cooked prove tough and unsavory long lines of herons patiently carry on fishing operations whilst flights of small white cranes wheel about in the air disturbed by the passing boat or else poise themselves on one foot on a fallen tree looking like some straight-laced bell in their pure white plumage and delicate elegance kingfishers and hummingbirds flit from branch to branch giving us a sight of the primary colors to make up for the absence of rainbows the magdalena is navigable in the whole length about nine hundred miles and at a considerable distance from the sea is still a magnificent stream with a depth which has already swallowed up some of the large steamboats until not even a vestige of the funnels are left in sight however in the months of january february and march the continued dry season reduces the quantity of water considerably and lays bare miles of sandbanks sometimes rendering navigation very difficult and dangerous except to those pilots who by their great practice can tell where the deepest channel is with no other aid than their careful observations which requires no small skill seeing that in a single flood a running body of water thirty feet deep will shift from one side of the river bed to the other leaving not more than two feet of water where there was formerly thirty when the magdalena is full of water the steamboats from barranquilla invariably run the first three nights when making the ascent after that navigation becomes extremely dangerous on account of the many large trunks of trees half hidden in the water late in the evening we arrived at a large village called remolino which contains about two thousand inhabitants mostly of a dusky copper color and evidently of negro origin the houses are of a miserable class all made of mud or wild cane i did not see a single stone construction the climate here is bad being charged with miasma especially after a rainy season the heat is also very oppressive on account of the river being full of water and favored with a beautiful moonlight the boat kept on up the stream the mosquitoes arriving in hordes we were obliged to take refuge under our mosquito nets until morning when we woke up to find ourselves fifty miles further up the river but unpleasantly to find as well that we were wet to the skin with the heavy dew which had fallen during the night the ordinary route from the river magdalena to the interior town of bucaramanga is by means of canoe on the river labria but in my desire to get a sight of the south american forests i left for the time being these more frequented ways and determined to take the path directly through the forest and with that intention after three days journey i left the steamboat at a small village called puerto wilches situated in one of the most luxuriant and beautiful parts of the valley of the magdalena the entire settlement consisted of about two dozen miserable huts the people by their swarthy color appeared to be half spaniard and half indian they live in a situation where the land is so rich that with the least exertion it would produce two or three crops yearly in their mud huts the very barest necessaries of life are very scarce for many weeks together bread is not to be had and flesh meat is equally scarce excepting game shot in the forest the principal articles of consumption are maize turtles eggs fish and bananas here i was treated to a dish which up to the present had been entirely unknown to me this is the flesh of a large lizard about three feet and a half in length shot by one of the natives in an adjoining tree after some trouble in skinning and preparing it i was induced by the cravings of a well whetted appetite to put aside all scruples of delicacy or custom and discuss the merits of the flesh of the celebrated iguana which to many of the natives is a dish of the greatest delicacy i found the flesh very tender and palatable 
and had it not been for the trouble recently experienced in skinning the scaly gentleman i might have believed it to be the fattest of some well-reared brood of chickens i spent three days here preparing for the journey and getting acquainted with the situation perhaps what surprises the traveller here is to find in this forest wilderness several railway wagons and about a thousand steel rails all in a pitiable state of wreck and dilapidation caused by the heavy rains these i am told are the remains of a scheme originated by the excellent colombian general solan wilches to carry the railway from this part of the river magdalena to the town of bucaramanga a distance of some one hundred and fifty miles a pity that through political disturbance so admirable a scheme was frustrated the heat in this part is almost unbearable and in the rainy season the ground becomes literally a swamp on account of the constant downpour of rain which is very violent often causing yellow fever and other epidemics the vegetation here is of the richest and every evening the stately coconut and clustering ivory nut palms are besieged with crowds of brilliant colored macaws swarms of large and small parrots fill the air with their screams large flights of pink and white cranes wheel about above the river in search of stray fish while the toucans with their enormous beaks quarrel with each other for some favorite fruit giving the whole situation an appearance at once novel and interesting to a foreigner on making inquiry about the path through the forest i was informed that no saddle horses had passed that way for several years and that the road was entirely filled up with fallen trees and creepers besides there were some eighteen branch rivers to cross at this time very much swollen with the recent rains these rivers of course without bridges must be crossed by swimming or on the branches of trees my first preparation for the journey was to engage the services of two natives real forest rangers as they afterwards proved these were called by the outlandish names of don isidoro hermenaldo and don anastasio montpulano but to somewhat simplify these extravagant and troublesome titles i christened them for the time being the one bob and the other tom bob the elder of the two appeared to be about twenty-three years of age tall and lithe his copper skin and hair of the deepest raven showed that since his indian forefathers held undisputed sway as lords of the forest he had not lost caste his black eyes possessed a fathomless cunning no doubt intensified by his profession of the chase a characteristic which gave a foreigner some misgivings as to his safety in such wily society his companion tom was still a lad seeming to be not more than fifteen years of age of much lighter colour and if possible of a constitution more slim and elegant in his rolling frolicsome eyes it was easy to read that mirthfulness of character which is peculiar to the free sons of the forest unfettered by the bonds of education each of my companions was eager to inform me that he was well acquainted with every turn of the path having been many times that way before and also was apt in the mysteries of tracking deer and wild pigs turkey and grouse as well as the jaguar and tiger-cat with which the woods abound knowing that we were not likely to meet with many inhabitants for more than two days march we accordingly laid in a stock of what provisions we could buy consisting of a few roots of the cassava plant jetropha manahat some flesh meat and bananas coffee and raw sugar together with candles matches and a stock of ammunition our cooking utensils were an old lard tin and some calabashes these being very much preferable to the native pottery which although very durable is very heavy at daybreak on the fourth day from landing we prepared to say good-bye to the people of puerto wilches who whatever they may lack in culture and resources certainly are not wanting in hospitality above all the excellent magistrate senor don eugenio castillo in whom every stranger will find a willing friend end of chapter five recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina
Chapter Six of Travels and Adventures of an Orchid Hunter by Albert Milliken. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Vegetation. At first, the path lay along the three miles of railway which had been constructed and abandoned several years before. This had now become entirely filled up with creepers and tall grass. Leaving the last rail behind, we quickly plunged into the thick forest where the road became a mere trail, which made it extremely difficult to proceed. First we were scrambling over some fallen trunks, then cutting our way through a thicket of prickly acacias, sometimes wading up to the knees in ditches caused by the heavy rains, at other times swinging ourselves, monkey-like, from one branch of a tree to another, in order to cross the turbulent, swift-running rivers without wetting our ammunition and provisions. But even with these difficulties, the path all the while lay through the midst of a vegetation of indescribable luxuriance and beauty, nature's original productions as yet unmarred by the woodman's axe or the plowshare. Gigantic timber trees from seventy to one hundred feet in height, festooned to the very summit with creeping alamandas, all aglow with their golden trumpet-like flowers, mixed and varied with the scarlet stars of the Taxonia van Valksimae, or the rich blue of the Ipomea, and the undergrowth of palms of the elegant Phoenix and Cocos families. These were supplemented by a carpet of the most beautiful mosses and low-flowering shrubs, while on the banks of the streams the rich crimson flowers of the creeping Certodira fulgida contrasted beautifully with its richly penciled leaves of velvet and gold, everything that could illustrate the glories of the vegetable kingdom, with the exception of orchids. And for these I scanned the trees eagerly, but always fruitlessly, on account of the altitude at which the best orchids are found being very much above the level of the Magdalena Valley. But nature had been scarcely less prodigal in her provision of animal life. Large and small lizards of the most exquisite markings, some which seemed to possess a coat of mail made of silver and turquoise, disturbed in their afternoon nap, hurried quickly out of sight in the long grass while birds of every fantastic shape and color flitted in and out of the feathery palms. Occasionally we came in contact with a colony of large brown monkeys, those missing links of Darwinian celebrity. At the sight of us they set up such a chatter as would almost lead one to suppose that they were discussing on the spot what possible motive could have induced us to venture so far from civilization. The woods were full of a kind of wild turkey, but we were not successful in shooting any. However, we bagged some birds about the size of a hen, which appeared to be a kind of grouse. The sun, already low in the heavens, warned us that it was time to prepare our camp, and in this my two guides proved how well they were accustomed to this kind of life. The forest to these primitive architects supplies everything. While the elder one was cutting some stout poles, the younger one disappeared and as quickly reappeared with an armful of fine creepers with which the poles were lashed together, first placing my Macintosh on the top, and then a thick covering of large palm leaves, so that in less than an hour they had finished the construction of a commodious shed. Not having been occupied in building operations, I had meanwhile made a fire, and prepared the grouse for cooking. These, well boiled, with some of the cassava roots, made us an excellent supper, being doubly acceptable for the long march since the midday meal had given us almost wolfish appetites. After supper we prepared each one a small calabash of steaming coffee, boiled in the lard tin and sweetened with raw sugar. After this, each one was content to light his roll of tobacco and so pass the night by the campfire. Before daylight the next morning, we were astir and raking together the smoldering embers of last night's fire, prepared our black coffee and roasted some bananas. This temperate repast, quickly and unceremoniously dispatched, each one shouldered his load and again we plunged into the dense forest. 
we had not gone far before a stream of considerable dimensions stopped our way for the time offering great obstructions not so much for ourselves who could easily cross by swimming but how to pass our packs with any sort of security offered no small difficulty finally finding a large tree fallen halfway across the stream by dint of one helping another we were able to pass and so continued our journey at noon as on the previous day we stopped to cook our midday meal and to rest a short time for although on account of the thick forest the sun did not strike upon us much still the heat in the middle of the day was extremely oppressive besides the fatigue occasioned by cutting our way through the thick clumps of prickly acacias made us glad to seek a little repose continuing our way after some refreshment the track as on the previous day lay through the same extravagance of vegetable and animal life a thousand delicate creepers hung in graceful festoons and woven into a tapestry compared with which a gobelin picture would make a poor contrast after a tiresome march at the end of the second day we arrived at the only hut which is to be found in all the journey through this part of the forest and considering that the nearest neighbors are on every side at least thirty miles distant the inhabitants of this forest prison as might be supposed had partaken considerably of the nature of their surroundings a hut of the most primitive construction stocked with a few calabashes sloth and tiger cat skins and blocks of wood the proprietor of the hut an old hunter showed himself extremely friendly and immediately offered us part of the provision nearest to hand being some cassava roots bananas and bread made of indian corn ground between two stones here we passed the night the whole of the next day and the following night as guests of the kindly native being obliged to make this delay on account of a terrific thunderstorm and heavy rain which continued to fall all day as the forest dried up somewhat in the night early next morning we prepared ourselves again for the journey but as the provisions which we had brought with us were all exhausted and we could buy nothing more here we left somewhat depending on the chance of meeting some stray wild pig or anything else which might come within range of our guns from the hut which we left in the morning to the next hut in the forest was a distance of twenty-four miles and there it was not certain that we should meet with any inhabitants we continued along the track with much the same surroundings as formerly up to midday and as we had seen nothing to shoot but some monkeys we were reduced to the necessity of making our lunch off some pineapples and other fruits which are plentiful enough about one o'clock in the afternoon while still following the track we left the thick forest and suddenly broke into what appeared to be a large dried-up lake the ground being perfectly flat and a kind of fine powdery sand covering the entire surface the only vegetation consisted of patches of miserable scrub here and there having no exact information of the breadth of the plain it appeared to me that we had walked about five miles when we again struck into the forest these five miles we had passed with the greatest difficulty an almost vertical sun heated the sand to a great degree and rendered the atmosphere stifling besides at each step the foot sank into the powdery mass up to the ankle nothing living was to be seen but at short intervals we passed the tracks of wild cattle as well as many footprints of the jaguar and tiger cat which are plentiful enough in all this part the footprints of cattle surprised me as large wild animals such as the buffalo or bison were entirely unknown in these forests however my companions informed me the race had originally escaped from some settlement on the edge of the forest after some rest we again struck on the path being anxious to reach the hut before night darkness came on suddenly about half past six o'clock as is usual in this latitude and unfortunately for us with night the thunder began to roll through the sky while the black clouds illuminated with bright streaks of lightning warned us that a storm was approaching we still kept on our way in hopes of reaching the hut but in vain 
quickly drops began to fall and then the fearful torrent which followed would make one believe that a cataract had broken loose over our heads the scanty shreds of clothing which each one wore were soon soaked my top boots as quickly filled and the water ran over the tops while the track became a stream everything which we carried became running with water the light pith with which the natives so easily produce fire together with the matches i had were equally rendered useless we were exhausted with the fatigue of the day's march and were without fire or provisions and the violence of the storm rendered it almost impossible to construct even a temporary shelter besides without this to stop short of the hut was to hazard our lives the two natives behaved admirably going first scrambling through the tangled brushwood the track being only discernible at intervals when the brilliant lightning lit up the gloomy surroundings about two hours after the storm broke upon us impelled by sheer desperation we arrived at the hut a tumble-down shed as may be supposed with the rain coming through in every part of the roof but to our joy there was a fire in the place and on examining further we discovered three natives huddled up in the driest part of the shed these were travellers like ourselves on their way from bucaramanga to the river magdalena they had arrived before the storm having had time to collect wood and cook their supper of the little provisions which they possessed they sold us some cassava roots and a little raw sugar quickly disencumbering ourselves of our dripping remnants of clothing we boiled some of the raw sugar in water this makes an excellent and refreshing drink when it is drunk warm being somewhat refreshed with this we next prepared the cassava roots and supped well on these and my companions heaping a large pile of wood on the fire we waited for daylight making ourselves as comfortable as possible under the circumstances not unmindful to providence that we were better there than in the open forest without shelter morning revealed to us the woods in all their grandeur again with scarce a trace of the hurricane which had swept over us the previous evening our first consideration was to dry everything we possessed by spreading it in the sun meanwhile our companions who were going in the opposite direction had breakfasted and taken to the track the preparation of our baggage delayed us until nearly noon but the guide said that we should find another hut at about twelve miles distance towards evening we came in sight of the andes having nearly crossed one half of the magnificent valley of the magdalena before sunset we had reached the hut which was situated about half a mile up the side of the mountain on a slight level a situation which commands one of the grandest sights it is possible to see on the right the magnificent forest plain stretches out towards the sea for two hundred miles and on the other hand as much the river magdalena is navigable for large steamboats about nine hundred miles and from this point of the andes on a clear day there is at least five hundred miles of the valley visible while directly in front may be seen the mighty range of mountains of antioquia and bolivar at a distance of a hundred miles or more the river may be seen from this point like a gilded serpent gliding away down towards the sea its silvery coils contrasted beautifully with the sombre green of the forest this evening we were more fortunate than the night before here we met with a party of colombians engaged in taking out gutta percha and they offered us every hospitality which their scanty resources afforded we started away next morning more refreshed and in better spirits than on the previous day this hut is called las mercedes and is situated about halfway up the mountain from which the town of bucaramanga lies some twenty-five miles on the other side before midday we reached the top of the mountain from this elevation the view is even more beautiful than before and the clear bracing air gives us an idea that the range of hills is at least four thousand feet high from here as well we began to discern the cultivated land and small villages on the outside of the forest after about four hours more of a most toilsome march down the side of the mountain where the track is scarcely discernible on account of the thicket of creepers 
we emerged into cleared ground and a fairly beaten track passing several straggling huts we finally reached a large house covered with red tiles an excellent specimen of the better class of country house in the interior of this part of colombia the owner being a coffee planter of considerable importance we arrived here in the evening and near to the house we were met by a crowd of young men and women each one bearing a large basket filled with coffee berries each workman being paid according to the weight of fruit picked during the day. The berries are afterwards spread out on cemented floors in the sun, where the outside rind of the fruit is taken off, and the coffee beans cleaned by first beating them in a mortar, and then subjecting them to a kind of winnowing process. The excellent Colombian proprietor of the estate, which is called El Naranjo, or the orange tree, treated us with every kindness which was doubly welcome after the rough life we had just experienced i passed the night here and early next morning engaged mules to proceed on my journey to the town of bucaramanga the road from this point to the town is supposed to be good which in fact it is compared with some of the roads but for any one who has not an idea of what is called a road in the republic of colombia i may describe it as a mere track worn into existence by the continual passing of mules with packs and riders often taking a roundabout way where a near one is at hand or climbing over a stony precipice when with the least forethought it might have been avoided besides in the rainy season the clayey soil becomes impregnated with water and works into a kind of substance in which the mules sink up to the saddle girth which makes it impossible for any other beasts but such as are accustomed to these roads to extricate themselves on leaving el naranjo the road lay through numerous plantations of coffee cocoa and sugar-cane broken at intervals by large patches of scrub the farmhouses are supplied with numerous buildings for drying tobacco crushing sugar-cane and preparing what is called panila this is the juice of the cane boiled poured into moulds and left to cool these moulds are square and the pieces of sugar are invariably small cakes about the size of a box of sardines as the juice has undergone no process of refinement the sugar produced in this way is generally very dirty and of a colour as dark as roasted coffee beans this is produced in very large quantities and is entirely consumed in the country either for cooking or in making the native beer or guarapo after about nine miles riding we came to a small village called canta abra this soon showed us how much the difference of elevation had to do with the social condition of the people compared with the natives of the valley of the magdalena instead of the strong indian or negro type so marked in the natives of the lowland the colombians here are fair-skinned good-looking and well-dressed although the village is one of the smallest in the vicinity of bucaramanga it boasts of a good large roman catholic church and several well-built houses but of course all of mud or what is called adobe here we breakfasted in true colombian style a piece of salt beef and cakes made of indian corn besides we had the inevitable cassava root and coffee the coffee made here on a coffee estate as may be supposed is an exquisite beverage possessing all the rich aroma which the berry loses by a long sea voyage after breakfast we started away at a rattling pace which did not slacken until we had gained the summit of a hill from which were easily discernible the strange half moorish half spanish towers of bucaramanga end of chapter six recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina